Thank you. And thank you, firstly, to this opportunity and to the invitation to be here with you during this afternoon. Well, firstly, um, I want to give a, a warm welcome to this panel, to Mrs. Amarilis Verhoeven, and of course to Gonzalo Caseiro, and to all the distinguished panelists. And for me, it is an honor to be with you during this afternoon. Well, some remarks related with this important topic. Firstly, I, need to, I really need to, to stress this, this issue and this aspect. When the Minister of Justice of Portugal challenged me to be the keynote speaker during this afternoon in this panel, uh, my, I asked myself, um, how many hours, how many time should I allocate for my intervention? Because the scope of, the, of this topic is quite high, wide. Uh, it's not because uh, the, the number or the, the I would say, the, the amount of different ideas I have about this topic. But more than that, it's because the magnitude, the sheer of, and of magnitude of this topic and all the intercurrencies and implications at various, various levels are issues that are so connected that it's quite difficult to focus in a, only and in one aspect. So I've raised two questions. The first question we should ask is, why is it so important to raise awareness for the relation between innovation and intellectual protection? And related with this question, I should say that the answer is pretty much straightforward. And as we usually say, the devil is always in the details. Which brings us to the internal dimensions of the internationalization process. And the most important issue during this afternoon is this relation between innovation, IP, and the internationalization, internationalization process of many, many companies and mainly uh, the internationalization process of many SMEs. And I would say that it is widely accepted that the product innovation and or product differentiation has a strong effect on the probability and propensity to export and to invest. In other words, on the ability to compete abroad, be it through the introduction of new manufacturing methods, new products, new means of pro product identification, or the recognition of specific characteristics, qualities, or reputation that a specific product had due to the place of origin. The numbers seems, or seem to support this view. According to the report, of intellectual, report on intellectual property rights, intensive industries, and economic performance in the European Union in 2019, which provides an assessment on the combined contribution to the economies of the EU from industries that make intensive use of different types of intellectual property rights, 45% of the total economic activity, it means the GDP in the EU, is related to IPR intensive industries. Furthermore, IPR intensive industries accounted for most of the EU's trade with the rest of the world and generated a trade surplus, thus helping to keep the EU's external trade broadly balanced. Portugal seems to be aligned with this trend, occupying in 2020 the 12th position as the most innovative, inno innovative country in the EU. And we need to stress, with three times the number of patents registered 10 years ago. Surely, that those of us that studied management recall the importance of innovation and positive differentiation in the internationalization process. This was as true decades ago as it is true today. We are amidst the first stages of the fourth industrial revolution, which has, as it is, main driving force, innovation. 
full automation of traditional manufacturing and industrial practices by using smart technologies will become a new normal. And companies, especially those that develop their business around new technology, technological pro platforms, need to prepare themselves for a new, more competitive international environment. Uh, as it was in our topic, it was written in our topic, a, metamor a metamorphosis of some sort, as mentioned in the panel team, as I said, is needed. We can only fully reap the benefits of innovation provided that the adequate IPR architecture is in place for several reasons. Protection provided by IPR serves as an incentive to inventors and creators. The revenues generated from commercially successful patent protected innovations make it possible to finance further technological research and development. IPR can be, we need to stress that, IPR can be in itself a tradable asset. It is a tradable asset. IPR increases the attractiveness of small businesses, SMEs, or innovative startups. And for us, a country with an uh, important number of startups, this issue is quite important in order to develop our economy. And lastly, a patent can prevent and will prevent, I'm sure, third parties from taking unlawful economic advantages from the efforts, efforts of the inventor or the creator. And that is something that we need to stress. We are protecting the efforts. We are protecting the time, the service, the goods of those who are creating new products and new production processes. Therefore, it is essential to foster innovation at the early stages of the internationalization process but also to ensure that this effort is closely linked to the development of what I like to call an IP culture. In other words, making sure that companies and entrepreneurs include in their growth and internationalization strategies an IP dimension to protect their trademarks, their GIs, their patents, and their designs. Capacity building on IPR for companies is, in this regard, a, of paramount importance for the development of this IP culture. According to a rec recently published study from the European Union IP Office and the European Patent Office, only 9% of SMEs resort to IPR. The current state of affairs has to change if we truly want to develop a knowledge-based innovative society. At uh, the national level, Portugal is enacting an ambitious strategic plan 2020-2023, led by, uh, by MP, which entails a substantial array of measures to incentive and support innovation and to provide the access to the best services, services to IP users. From a capacity building standpoint, an uh, overarching internationalization strategy of the Portuguese government also includes several and different initiatives aimed at reinforcing IP awareness among economic agents, as well as mechanisms for the singling out and response to IPR infringement situations. As EU presidency, Portugal has given the priority to the promotion of a sustainable and an innovative economic recovery based on those twin transitions, the green and the digital transition. This can only be achieved with an adequate IPR framework. An IP 
framework which is accessible and affordable to all, which is clear and tendentially uniform throughout the EU, and which provides an effective and enforceable scope of protection. We acknowledge, in this regard, the relevant contributions for the debate provided by the recent EU Commission communication, making the most of the EU's innovative potential and intellectual property action plan to support the EU's recovery and resilience. This is going to be, I'm sure, the focus of Mrs. Verhoeven's intervention. This leads me, as I said, to my second question. You probably remember, I said before, I've raised two questions. This was the first one, but the second one is, how do we transpose these IP principles and standards to a wider international arena? How do we provide the best market access from an IP standpoint? Only an incorrigible optimist would look at today's intricate world trade system mosaic as a global market. It's quite difficult to define the international trade nowadays as taking place in a global market. This should indeed be our aspirational goal, to have a global market, a borderless world for goods, services and ideas for the benefit of all. However, nevertheless, this is not the trend. And we know this is not the trend. We are witnessing, a, as the protectionism looms, even in the most unsuspected places. And this brings me to the impact of IPR on the external dimension of the internationalization process. As the EU Commission communication states, and rightly states, our businesses need to rely on a stable, global level playing field when competing abroad and the EU and its member states are in a unique position to act as a global standard, standard setter in IP. Be it through the inclusion of ambitious IP chapters on FTAs, free trade agreements, being ne negotiated, or by the conclusion of standalone instruments, such as, as the, ver the very recent promising EU-China GI, or Geographical Indications Agreement. GIs are, in fact, an area of IP protection where the EU, and I need to stress, and Portugal, I must say, I need to stress, for us as is an important issue, are, we are very vocal. The EU advocacy of GIs worldwide has led to a positive results with an increasing number of non-EU countries considering the adoption of similar regimes. Secondly, by having a strong and united approach to multilateral fora, such as WIPO, WTO, or OECD, among others, where IP matters are becoming ever more central by promoting IP dialogues and by extending to multilateral IPR treaties. Thirdly, by providing technical assistance to the implementation of national IPR frameworks in, de in developing countries to pool registry and enforcement resources. MP, for instance, the Portuguese uh, authority, MP, for example, has a substantial and a very successful track record of cooperation with developed and non-developing countries. Non-developed countries. Lastly, by supporting and funding international registration of IPR and by raising awareness on the available regimes of protection, especially to SMEs, 
and for them, mainly for them, for SMEs, as these are, most of the times, important, but rather uninformed innovation agents. Finally, in conclusion, after my answer to, this, those, to these two questions, finally, in conclusion, innovation and IPR protection cannot be dissociated. One cannot exist without the other, and in fact, they are mutually reinforcing. Only with sound measures enforced to promote the use and to protect the innovation-related IP in the inter inter internal market and abroad, in third countries, can the EU aspire to maintain, in a time of radical changes, its current position as one of the most competitive and vibrant economies in the world. Europe needs to be a global player. To be a global player and to be a global actor needs to be in global trade and to promote FTAs and investment agreements. We really want to do it taking into account our standards, our principles and our values. And to do so, we really need to have a strong, a quite strong and effectively IP policy. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me all. I am very happy to reach out uh, to all of you, even if it is only from my little home office in the outskirts of Brussels and not in beautiful Portugal. But um, I'm very happy to be present at this conference because I believe we are, very, we are discussing very important matters here today. We are discussing the future of our IP system, which indeed has been, as has been said already so eloquently by the former speaker, is of key importance if we want to put Europe on track to recovery, to resilience, if we want to ensure the global competitiveness of our industries. Very fortunately today, we are amongst IP experts. So we know that this is the case. But I'm very happy that the former speaker already presented some of the key studies that have been conducted over the last years, showing the importance of IPR and IPR intensive industries for the European economy. I will not repeat the numbers. Let me just draw your attention to additional numbers, showing that what determines the value of our businesses today in our increasing digitalized economies is not so much tangible assets. It is really the value of today's companies. And here we're talking about 84 or more percent of companies' current value is constituted by intangibles. Now, what are intangibles? These are the brands. This is the know-how. These are the inventions. This is also the data. These are the typical assets. These are the creations. These are the assets that are very often IP protected and need to be IP protected in order to be valued, in order to be monetized. That's the real gold, the real currency of the new digital knowledge-based economy. And that is why we as Europeans need to do our utmost best in order to be able to protect these assets but also to monetize them, to commercialize them, to make them work to the benefit of our economies as a whole. And that's actually what the IP Action Plan aims to achieve. I have only a very short moment. You are all able, of course, to read the IP Action Plan. Let me just give you some highlights. 
what is it we as a European Commission want to achieve? First of all, let me tell you, our ambitions cannot be achieved alone. We are only able to achieve the ambitions in the IP Action Plan, and let me tell you that from the outside, if all of us work together, that is, all the European players in the IP world, the European patent offices, the national patent offices, the member states themselves in the context of their national recovery plans. You can do a lot to boost awareness about IP, to make sure that SMEs make the most of IP. And then, of course, all the stakeholders, the banks, the financial institutions, we all must work together in order to make sure that our intangible assets are properly valued, protected, commercialized, put at the service of our real economy. So the IP Action Plan is really also a call for joined up work of all of us together in order to make the most of IP. What are the key challenges we see and what is it we want to do? First of all, and that's the first key pillar of the IP Action Plan, we want to make sure that the IP system we have in Europe, which is already of high quality, is totally fit for purpose for today's digital economy. Digitization has already been mentioned very often here. Well, indeed, it is also a key priority for us. Protection systems, already our commissioners have mentioned this morning, the importance of the unitary patent in that context. That remains a key objective. But we go beyond. We are also in a process of revising, for instance, the design protection system. Why? Because we want to make sure it is totally fit for the digital age. And we know there is some work to be done there, because the framework dates back from the 90s. And there are some uncertainties that need to be clarified. GIs was mentioned. In a globalized world, let us not forget to protect our traditional heritage. That is why we are reforming the GI system, both the agricultural system, but also working towards an introduction of a non-agri-GI protection system at the European level. I just name a few of the initiatives we are taking in order to overcome the remaining fragmentation on the European market, but also in order to make sure that the IP protection we can offer to our businesses is um, as much as possible fit to the needs of our current day economy. Second pillar of our work, promoting an effective uptake of IP protection, in particular by our SMEs. And there, there is still a lot of work to be done. SMEs just don't think about IP. Why would you, if you are a startup, if you're an innovator, if you are a creator, you're thinking of doing business. IP seems to be like a blunt legal issue. You don't want to deal with it. It's complex. It's unwieldy. Yeah, it's costly. And you might actually not know what to do with it because at the end of the day, you might be confronted with counterfeits. For, there are a lot of reasons why SMEs don't go for IP protection, but we know that if they don't, they are actually losing out. And that threat exists in particular in the current Corona pandemic situation. And that is why together with the IPO, we have put in place an IP voucher system, financial help for SMEs, European SMEs, to go and file for IP protection, but also to go and have an IP scandal, which is a diagnosis of their portfolio in order to see what is actually the protection and the strategy that can help them make the most of their intangible assets. This is just one of the actions. Let me flag you another very important one, and that is promoting access to finance on the basis of intangibles. It's not good enough to have your IP protected. You also want to make sure 
as a young startup company for whom the assets are purely intangible assets that when you knock on the door and you need finance, which is what you need in order to stay alive and to grow, you can get access to finance based on your intangibles. And that's why we're working together with national promotional banks, with venture capitalists, in order to make sure that it becomes easier to get access to finance on the basis of IP. Third pillar, a lot has been said about protection of IP. Important, very important, but it is the first step. Intangibles in our current day economy need to be shared out. A lot of our critical assets that are almost critical infrastructure assets are IP based. Think about standard essential patents, patents that underpin standards such as connectivity standards. In the new industry, Internet of Things economy, all objects will be connected. And that means that all objects need somehow, in order to be developed, rely on connecti connectivity technologies which are patented. And that means that more and more industry players need to have access to standard essential patents in a smooth and efficient manner. This is just one of an uh, one example of an area where we need to de take a deep look into how exactly licensing is taking place. Where critical assets are involved, it is not good enough to say, oh, licensing, isn't that just, you know, the business of private parties? It is, of course, the business of private parties. Licensing is a contract and a contract governed by contractual freedom. But there are certain rules of the game to be respected in order to make sure that licensing works to the benefit of all. Rules of fairness, rules of transparency. That goes for the licensing of standard essential patents, but that also goes for other areas. I mentioned standard essential patents where we are now taking initiatives in order to enhance transparency and predictability. Think of data, data sharing. Data is the new gold. And we know that our industries in all the relevant ecosystems stand to benefit from a much better data sharing. Think of the health sector. If the health sector were able to find good tools to share clinical data and others and other elements, Good data sharing can help facilitate processes, can help um, achieve a much better outcome for patients. Now we know that data is very often IP protected. So here again, we have to put in place tools which facilitate data sharing whilst also protecting the under, underlying value. Data has a value, IP has a value. That needs absolutely to be protected, whilst we need at the same time to promote the sharing out. So in the IP action plan, we put a focus as well on access issues, which for us are very important. Fourth pillar of the IP action plan, better protection against IP theft. And that's indeed the bad part of the story. Also in the context of the pandemic, we've seen that counterfeits and also piracy is still on the rise. Think of fake masks, think of fake medicines. We cannot accept these fakes. They are putting us in danger economically, but also from a health perspective or from a security perspective. Now, together with many players, we've been working for years in order to stop or cut back on counterfeits. But we see that where we are, it is not yet good enough. And that's one of the drivers behind the famous Digital Services Act, uh, one of those acts that the Commission adopted before Christmas and which has been covered in the press. In this act, the aim is to set forth 
clear rules uh, prescribing or setting out responsibilities of platforms. For instance, responsibilities of platforms in connection with protection of consumers against fake, fakes, yeah, against counterfeit products. Platform responsibility clear rules should help us here, but they're not in themselves, they will not be sufficient. And that's why we will be working towards a genuine anti-counterfeiting toolbox. That is a set of recommendations prescribing in detail, setting out in detail what all the actors along the value chains have to do in order to prevent and stop counterfeits. And what also public authorities, such as market surveillance authorities, for instance, should be doing in order to stop counterfeits. And how all these actors should be working together. We have the technologies today. The technologies have brought us difficulties, but they all are also offering today the solutions. There are blockchain-based technologies. There is data sharing, which has become a lot easier now than it was ever before. Let's use them. And that's what the counterfeiting toolbox is about. We hope uh, at the end of the Portuguese mandate to set the first steps in the context of the enforcement forum in June, where we hope to already come up and find agreement amongst all the stakeholders there about a couple of high level principles to be respected. And on that basis, we will further roll out the toolbox. Last but not least, it was already mentioned the global context. And there the key question we should be asking ourselves in the digitalized world. Do we want as Europe? Do we want to be standard setters? Or do we want to be standard takers? Well, I believe that our Commission President has, has made it very clear that we as Europe, we want to be standard setters. We are promoting, thinking about a digital context, a human-centered and a rules-based approach to the digital economy. And we are promoting as well a high level of IP protection, which can help us achieve this. At, in the global context, we are um, we can and must uh, work together in order to make sure that our IP rules are also respected worldwide. And that is what we need to do through WIPO. That is what we need to do through the free, free trade agreements. That is what we need to do through technical cooperation. And that is why we devote a whole chapter with specific actions about this in the IP action plan. Thank you very much for allowing me to present. As I said in the beginning, the action plan is just a blueprint of the Commission, but it is really a call for action, not only for us as a Commission, but for all of us together. Stakeholders, authorities, IP offices across Europe. If we all work together, then we can make sure that us Europeans can make the most of our intangibles. So I thank you for your attention and I thank you very much for organizing this very interesting conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christina Amar. Let me start by congratulate, congratulating the MP for this initiative and in extending obviously my compliments to the Minister of Justice, Francisco Van Dunen, and to all the present and to all the present Portuguese and European leaders for endorsing uh, a team, a topic that is so relevant and for contributing to place it in the, in the agenda of European debate. I would also like to, first of all, thank the speakers present at this round table, Daniela, Paula and Ulf. I hope I, I get this right. I got this right uh, for sharing me the, the commitment to discuss and uh, what might be the business metamorphosis and research in the age of digital transformation. I think with such, a spe such speakers, this can only go very well. The, the issues uh, associated with this uh, intellectual property and patents are in majority not an end in themselves, but rather a way for organizations to bring to their activity incentives for innovation 
and consequently an improvement in the production and services they, they provide. The secret is to, to, to balance what must be more open, to foster more competition and the necessary protection in ways that encourage innovation. The question I leave you to begin with is the following. How can organizations facing this metamorphosis in this area of uh, um, accelerated uh, digital, digital transformation, how, how can organizations transform themselves to, to face all of this? So without uh, further delays, let me pass the word to Daniela Braga. Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, well, I was asked to say something something about um, in intellectual property in this context. Um, maybe I'll share a little bit about our own experience at the Fine Crowd um, with with this in regards to this matter. Uh, for those who don't know who, what we are. Who, we are and what we do, we are a, a one-stop shop for training data for AI uh, and the AI that has to do with human-computer interaction. So essentially, we um, simulate and uh, simulate data for especially speech and text data in 50 languages across um, 100 uh, countries. Um, to create uh, what we call today conversational AI, so virtual assistants with voice or without voice, so chatbots or the um, series and Alexas of the world, as well as um, uh, other cognitive services, uh, being really speech uh, and natural language processing across languages and markets our forte. Um, when models need to be improved, uh, you need a different kind of data. You, you either uh, handle your client's data uh, in a secure way, uh, which has other uh, privacy issues, which is a different story, uh, or you uh, continue to, or you annotate or continue to simulate that kind of data. Um, we uh, are we are global. We have we are based in Seattle, where I live. Uh, we have a, the biggest headcount of R and D in Portugal, with over 250 people in a company that, in the last five years, has grown uh, to over 300 uh, people, uh, and uh, that uh, has uh, quickly internationalized because we started in the United States from a European perspective. Uh, we also are VC-backed, uh, over 64 million in um, funding. And one thing that, um, coming from a research background and uh, and doing uh, and starting in Europe with my research uh, uh, background, I obviously have filed a number of patents uh, over my career. And one of the things we did immediately at the Fine Crowd was filing a number of patents as well uh, at um, rate. Uh, about uh, two to three a year, which is not a lot. Uh, but and but the thing is, patents are first expensive, second very time consuming, third only regionally enforced. So you really have to pick your battles when you are a startup, uh, which we are not anymore, but we used to be. And, and you, you have to first pick your battles on time and money, on where to spend, and geography. And uh, related to IP, which, is not, uh, which, which is not being addressed here, is the brand, uh, the brand registration. For example, we uh, register, and we, and we chose the United States as our, our regional investments on patents to be uh, very clear here, mostly because it's been 95% of our revenue. Um, but the reality is we operate globally. We have a subsidiary in, in Japan. Uh, we, we sell, we're starting to sell to more APAC uh, region. And it's been, well, while I have less concerns around uh, break of uh, IP in Europe, um, in, in Asia, and in the United States, to be honest, is, is been, it is a very common thing. And it's very expensive to fight. Uh, and I've seen it through my career as well. I've worked with a company before that basically claims that had the first Alexa and Amazon took over the patent. So even in the United States, with a patent registered, 
you really uh, see yourself as a uh, suddenly against a giant and you can't really fight that uh, legally it's just impossible for a company of 300 people to fight an amazon so i'm just saying that how do you overcome even though you protect your ip how do you overcome uh, your competitive advantage uh, it's it's really with speed to market and speed to market is only uh, able to be done with funding uh, we can talk about a lot of uh, uh, regional and cross-regional, the GI's uh, policies of trying to, uh, uh, trying to consolidate uh, policies around uh, uh, regions or countries. But in the end of the day, uh, you can, I mean, you cannot really uh, fight it until you have stickiness with your clients. And for that, it, you have to move fast and sometimes under the radar. Um, that's uh, for funding. You need VC funding and uh, obviously uh, sometimes you, government public funding, which we don't have, but uh, it's probably what I can tell about our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, without further delays, and believe me, I had uh, a lot of questions to, to, to address to you. Uh, we can do that after uh, everyone's introduction. Without further delays, I will pass now uh, the word to Paula. Paula, the floor is yours, please. Uh, hi, Gonzalo. Well, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, and uh, to um, I'll, I'll probably reinforce some of the topics that we've uh, we've heard already, um, and uh, namely, if uh, we think about uh, the digital transformation and uh, the the acceleration of technology adoption that we are going through, that is putting uh, uh, no doubt uh, also a need on the acceleration of uh, innovation as a way to differentiate in these. Uh, more and more global economy. So rules and legislative uh, frameworks will need to adapt to these changes and following and influencing this transformation that is going at a very fast speed. And uh, that includes, of course, the IP rights and the IP policies. Um, this new set of rules, though, need to find the right balance, I would say, between, uh, on one side, the increasingly need to promote this innovation, so protecting the IP is critical to ensure the innovation is valued is incentivized but on the other hand we are really living on a data-driven economy we've just heard uh, Marilis talking about it the great booster for growth and for more opportunities for all will depend on data sharing and on the use of data so if i may uh, reinforce here the relevance of open data moving forward um, everyone can benefit from opening sharing collaborating around data to make better decisions, improve efficiencies, and uh, most importantly, even help tackle some of the world's most pre pressing societal challenges. We've talked the health uh, or a climate uh, sustainability and more and more. So if we want to avoid this digital divide with ones uh, thriving and the others left behind on uh, what is related to availability and accessibility to data, we really need to create this inclusive growth and open data is a great way to help. So to drive the valuable social economic outcomes that uh, can come from data, organizations need to be able to access, but also to share data. And uh, IP should definitely not be a barrier to access this data and to share the data, but rather a way to continue to value and incentivize innovation while creating the conditions for these uh, uh, open data models to, to move forward. Um, at Microsoft, we strive uh, to be responsible leaders shaping the global IP and open innovation ecosystems, um, very actively engaging on policy discussions, but uh, uh, also uh, with a strong focus on creating these sustainable environments for future innovation and creativity to be uh, developed. So we are deploying IP portfolio to help customers, partners, but also developers across the, the globe to build on top of our technology, to uh, build their own innovations and to build their own differentiation. And then um, also with uh, the partner ecosystem, create the conditions through, for example, in our case is a solution catalog where um, these partners can 
have a unique uh, global scale way of uh, reaching out to many companies that are today our customers and can become also their own customers uh, using a kind of a co-sell behavior on uh, their IP that is built on top of our technology, but we kind of open the doors to make it uh, more and more accessible across the globe. Um, for a final remark, I would just say that Europe plays a critical role filing, finding this right balance, uh, promoting competitiveness, um, more inclusive economy, bringing more opportunities for companies all sizes through these open data. So creating the legal and the policy framework where data is sh shared in, of course, what has to be a safe, secure and a compliant way. Um, we've launched in April 2020 um, the Open Data Campaign and basically is an effort to create certain principles that will uh, basically guide uh, for us the way to share data, but also establish uh, further partnerships, um, not only with the Open Data Institute, but also uh, with uh, uh, other industries across our own industry, governments and civil society, especially academy, to really help ensure the, uh, that everyone can realize through the open data models the benefits of the data available. Um, and these were probably my first remarks so that we allow also for some questions later on, Gonzalo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. We now heard from uh, two women who are leading multinational companies, not only multinational companies, but complete ecosystems. Um, and now uh, I will give the floor to, to Ulf, who has worked um, in re several research and innovation environments as an attorney, which changes a little bit the perspective from business leaders uh, to, to you, Ulf. So, so uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you for the kind introduction, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers, Primary Inti, for allowing INL to be present in this venture and to discuss these uh, topics that are totally critical for not only for INL, but for the ecosystem that we are part of. Yes, let me start with a few introductions to INL. Uh, yes, it is a truly cross-border collaboration. It is an intergovernmental organization uh, born in 2008 by Portugal and Spain joining forces. And it also captures the essence of these key enabling technologies that is one of the motors of this in collaboration to, to the digital transformation, motors of the fourth uh, industry revolution. And it is in that perspective I would like to have the discussion today. We are not alone as a organ research organization or company. It's a collaboration with commercial entities, small SMEs, individual inventors and research organizations and universities that we will bring uh, together and, and have to capture the intellectual assets generated. Uh, we have seen recently uh, in our efforts that we, on a more pr practical note, that complexity adding in all layers. It actually, it, it's added on the complexity of making new business models, the data generated by the technologies, the sensors, for instance, are to be shared in, in larger and larger collaboration, a specific need to, to enable to the development of key enabled technologies that not only uh, is is grown out of a lot of knowledge generation through on a global setting, but also very delicate machinery and, and, and instrumentations all over the world. There we see uh, a, a great, and I've heard a lot about it today, the openness of the European Union to allow people to tra be transferred and to move from different organizations. But with that comes a complication. We also see that it's, it's not intellectual property rights only that need to be addressed. It's the know-how and generation of knowledge in this organization and the flow of people and information that we need to find efficient measures to capture this creativity, but also to safeguard it that it makes, makes a commercial uh, imprint uh, after, after leaving sort of the research arena. Uh, and with this, I think it, and we have initiated, I'm very proud to be part of that on the national and also European level, uh, interaction with all the IP practitioners, researchers, and uh, and our um, offices when it comes to intellectual property, not only on the patent side, 
But this is the core. I think we need to grow and develop together and learn from each other. So we speak the same language that we will create more efficient processes to 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 the to maintain this high quality IP system that you have today. And let me let me start by I think this. I started my career about 20 years ago. We were dealing with investigation of quantum systems. That was far from applications. Today we have seen how they are close to the hardware, they are close to the software, they are close to the super softwares that we are in person today. And it's an oppressive journey, not only from science, but also for intellectual property to be able to adjust for this. And a modern system should keep pace with this. And I think we will see a very interesting trends. A few observations in the end. Inventive step when it comes to innovation has becoming even more complicated to foresee and have transparent uh, uh, processes for it. It was talked about by Daniela. It varies a lot in different jurisdictions how you look upon this. Uh, this is something we need to address, to especially from the SMEs, to simplify their journey and to capture the innovation. We saw the registered right versus know-how, how to manage this in a global world. Ownership is also a very important thing, the, the collaboration becoming bigger. Who owns what, who contributed to what? We need efficient tools that assist us in this. And on the, on the counterfeiting and authentication, we also see a very strong and very, I think, very encouraging thing. We go here from measures on the quantum level to materials uh, in printing and, and, and technology advancements to, to to curb this counterfeiting to the digital arena. And I, with that, I would like to, to open the board for discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all three uh, very distinct introductions. I will start with Danielle again. Uh, I noticed that you said that you had to pick our battles. Uh, you, you had to pick, you, you, we have to pick battles uh, in order to succeed as leaders and in order to succeed as companies. Um, your introduction was quite interesting and I understood that you wanted to uh, discussion, the discussion on IP and patents to be done uh, at an international level. Um, can you go further on that and, and uh, try to, to explain how, how that can even help Europe to, as Amarili really said, try to lead? Absolutely. Well, uh, that international level, because the rules for filing, the, the prices to maintain, for, to file and maintain patents, because once you file, then there's a whole long process to, to keep going with that. So we're, we're still dealing with the same patents uh, of five years ago uh, to continue. Uh, every, every country and Europe versus US has, have a different process. Um, it's essentially the, the, I mean, because on one hand side, you have to pick the region and you have to repeat the process in EU. So for example, if we are to, to, uh, to do this in, in the US, it's not enforceable or sometimes the rule doesn't apply. So there are certain areas and certain, uh, types of inventions that are not, uh, recognized in Europe and vice versa. Um, and not to mention, uh, for me, the Wild East, as I usually uh, think about it in APEC, uh, where it's even more difficult to, to enforce that um, and, to, and to deal with the rules there. So, so what I mean when I mean pick your battles, pick your countries. So first of all, when not just the policies should be discussed to be more homogeneous, to be more uh, similar across countries and regions, but the, the, the process of application should be uh, simplified. So if you have started in one place, you don't have to start from scratch again in another place, which is, which is the way it works. So no one in a, a journey of fast moving growth company has, uh, we really can't afford that as much as patents val uh, help in the valuation of our company. Um, they don't make the big, they, they, in, the, in the end of the day, to be very frank, for VCs, uh, they have only a certain amount of value uh, because they go through the financials, uh, they look at the financials, the financial KPIs, 
and uh, and that's what really matters for uh, VCs. Uh, and 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 then patents have this little uh, weight. Uh, it's nice to have. It's a nice to have. So there's one not enough incentive to 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 do that. Number two, uh, not enforceable in most regions. You file it in one place, you you are completely exposed in the rest of the world. And number three, um, uh, the the rules are different. Uh, and so, yeah, you, you can imagine that. Also, asking to our machine learning scientists and AI scientists to spend time on with lawyers to do that while they should be actually contributing for the automation of the and revenue and margins of the company it's a it's a tough uh, thing to ask we we are going to start this year an incentive program for for which is a typical thing Microsoft used to have that to actually file more internally because it's really you're gonna have to do that on your uh, out of uh, beyond your working time, you know that this is always a beyond your working time thing. Thank you. Uh, well, so uh, we we understand the the pain, uh, Paul. Uh, as a leader on a on a also a, a global company, um, I know that there's uh, some approaches that Microsoft is having on IP, open data. But how are how are how is Microsoft uh, supporting its partners? With uh, their solutions at the at the global scale, so um, we we really believe that innovation is more and more an ecosystem play, right? So uh, that's why we have uh, uh, come to the point of developing two big initiatives. So on one side, it is uh, open data, in many times even open code. So I can tell you that we by now have many of our own engineers contributing to the open source uh, libraries of code so that we enrich the, the base for everyone to then create in a speed to market to, to go to Daniela's point, which is more and more relevant. And that's why uh, all the initiatives related with the openness and to the ability of using uh, as an ecosystem, um, data being the, the key one for uh, startups to uh, gain uh, uh, the, on the IE front like Daniela's one, but also because more and more within the company is we see the use of these uh, IE services as being critical for differentiation of services. So that's one. The other one is really to set up what can be marketplaces of IP to the world. Um, and uh, because we do have a global footprint, um, we, we are very keen on creating these marketplace of partner solutions. So it's really a third party solution uh, that uh, all our sellers, but also all our customers can have access to. Um, they have uh, our technical certification, if you want. So from a technical standpoint, but also from a, a regulation standpoint, they are pre-validated before they can reach these uh, marketplace catalog but from there on we even incentivize our own people to position these uh, third-party ip solutions to our customers for a, a speed up of the go-to-market in uh, the customers so really a notion of uh, ecosystem of innovation where um, you can access the best of breed uh, no matter the industry you are in for the problem you want to solve while at the same time we position from portugal to the globe or from any other geo to the world, the best solutions and the best IP to speed up the go-to-market, which I think is more and more what creates the competitiveness and the differentiation for um, the, the SMEs, uh, big companies or companies any side, uh, any size uh, in the world. Thank you, thank you, Paula. Uh, Ulf, uh, uh, it seems that uh, business landscape is really changing rapidly to to adapt to create these ecosystems of innovation. As 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 Paula said, um, we heard from Daniela all the pains, um, and I just saw a comment on Twitter uh, uh, that uh, the question was how can patents foster innovation instead of hindering it? And I think that uh, what we have to see is how to challenge. Uh, how to combine the rapidly changing business landscape as we saw uh, right right now uh, um, with the slower moving IP processes. So how how uh, how to approach and face that that challenge? 
So thank you. It's, it's a very relevant question and something I think everyone out on the and IP landscape kind of tackles every day how to keep pace with these rigorous um, models that needs to be on the on the law legal side. Many things, uh, I think we, the, this process and we are seeing it from the research and innovation uh, side is if you do the right measures at the right time, you start off right, many of these uh, delays could be mitigated. It comes from pre-proposal pre, uh, stages, it comes to it, when, when starting discussions that you have, have done your homework, you have captured your intellectual assets and they could be through the, the registered rights as we have been discussed today or written down and kept as not trade secrets or knowledge. So doing your homework, I think, is speeds up the process. There are a lot of efficient measures then to, to prosecute quicker today, for instance, in, in Europe. And I think take advantage and share this knowledge and best practices is what's, what's needed at this stage. I'm sorry, my mic was uh, on mute. This is the, the sentence of uh, the phrase of the of 2020-2021. I'm sorry. Um, just just to 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 go back and one simple question to you, Paula. Um, it's, it's how, how what uh, what uh, global initiatives could you highlight for Microsoft's IP and open data approach? Um, that you would like to to talk to us uh, really really quickly, and uh, I still want to. I still have two minutes, and I'll still go to Daniela for one final comment. Okay. Very good. So we've launched this open data campaign. I invite you all uh, to just check it uh, in the microsite. Uh, there is a full explanation uh, on it, but uh, basically uh, it uh, has uh, three uh, main pillars. So one being the fact of uh, us uh, uh, defining our five new principles to, to guide us on uh, our own approach to data sharing and uh, to data collaborations. Those principles being open, usable, empowering, secure and private. So those are the principles that we will be using to embrace those uh, uh, open data partnerships. The second uh, pillar being uh, uh, establishing those partnerships. And uh, we've started a strong one with the Open Data Institute, as I mentioned, but we are expanding it, uh, namely to the academy, uh, governments, uh, research centers um, that uh, are uh, more interested in uh, solving for some of the main uh, problems that we face today. And we have uh, several um, uh, for our initiatives more focused on what we call the AI for good, um, namely uh, uh, to, to address uh, sustainability, digital uh, literacy, but also um, food uh, resourcing, for example, across the globe. And uh, those are three great example, examples on uh, how we can, uh, uh, together with uh, the community, uh, really try to solve for climate change, for example, the ability to leverage the high quality open data will be critical to enable the investment community will make on informed decisions based on these uh, reliable economic models around climate that uh, we all uh, aim to see on these uh, green economy recovery that is up to coming. And that's one of the key projects, for example, that we are that we are setting up. So we invite Thank you, you to or more around the open data campaign from Microsoft. Thank you, Paula. Daniela, uh, a close remark uh, from you, um, please. Well, um, I think I, I keep insisting on the funding, right? Support funding to go to market, to, to the speed to market is in the end of the day, generation IP only makes sense if it uh, creates wealth and creates uh, jobs and Etc. All of those things. Um, one of the things that I believe that you, Europe could do better is to uh, really pick less investment areas and pour more investment or channel more investment to them instead of splitting and spreading out into a thousand types of sub sub areas and maybe funding 5,000 SMEs, but my point is sometimes what, it, what you don't find, and that's what take, takes any country to and any region to the next level, 
is uh, later stage companies, uh, even consortia, but later stage more being more backed. So it's relatively easy, actually very easy today to access to early stage capital, whether it's public or private, very, very hard to, to, to uh, uh, access to later stage capital in areas that matter and that will, because all of that will create more wealth. While focus, this focus, uh, focus more. Uh, that's focus the point. More. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Ulf. It was, uh, um, I have to thank you for all your valuable contributions. I hope this time it has added value to the debate of such interesting topics and we still le leave uh, much to, to say. Um, thank you very much and wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.